So Acts chapter 21, the Apostle Paul has been warned time and again that when he goes to Jerusalem, bad things will happen to him, and it's about to take place. And we talked about that a few weeks ago now. And so when he comes to the brothers in Jerusalem, they're going to advise him, here's what you need to do. The accusation, verse 21 is kind of the key here for us to understand. It says, and, and they told... Um, the, the Jews are zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. In other words, the Mosaic law, Moses, Mosaic law. Telling them not to circumcise their, their children or walk according to their custom. Now, to be clear, he had been telling the Gentiles that, but not necessarily the Jews that. So he wasn't telling the, the Jews not to circumcise themselves. He was offering to the Jews that salvation does not come through circumcision. But what he was trying to communicate is that to the Gentiles, you don't need to become a Jew in order to be one of God's people. You don't need to be circumcised and try to keep the law and all these things. But the Jews are hearing what kind of what they want to hear. And he, they're saying that, falsely accusing Paul of saying that just... Abandon the law, Jews. Abandon Moses and all of that. So the the half-brother of Christ, who was James, the, the first pastor there in the church in Jerusalem, is giving uh, Paul some counsel as to how to handle this. So he says in verse 22, What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. These men... and Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they uh, may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Now, this seems like a contradiction. Paul's been teaching you don't need the law. And now James is saying, show that you're still living by the law. What's going on here? So, again, Paul had never said or told the Jews, at least as recorded for us in Scripture, that the Jews were to stop stop offering sacrifices, stop making vows to God. It wasn't a contradiction to still offer sacrifices, but what you had to understand is that salvation comes through Jesus, that the sacrifices pointed to Jesus, that these vows are not a means of earning fair with God, but rather an act of commitment to the Lord, and so you could still do some of these practices that God had instituted under the Mosaic Law and not rely upon them for your salvation. Are you with me? Do you track with that? And so they're saying, go. there's four guys that were probably um, under a vow of the Nazarite. I always have to stop and think. I get Nazarite and Nazarene confused. Jesus was a Nazarene. Is that right? Nazarene. This is the Nazarite vow. See, I messed it up. So, um, under a Nazarite vow, uh, back in the book of Numbers, nobody who takes this vow, so for some people they entered it involuntarily, Samson, uh, John the Baptist, there were those that could enter it voluntarily. If they enter it voluntarily, um, beforehand they could do these things, but while in the vow you cannot. So you cannot get a haircut during that vow. You could not eat anything of the vine. So no grape juice, no raisins, uh, no vinegar, and no nothing. Nothing from the vine during that period of time. You could not touch a dead body during that time. So if somebody died in your family, you could not be a pallbearer. You could not help carry the body out. You could not tend to them in any way. If you did, you'd have to offer a sacrifice and start your, your vow length all over again. For those who were entered into it involuntarily, like Samson, as long as he lived, he was not allowed to do these things. He did. All right? And there were consequences for that. So there were four who apparently were doing this. I don't believe Paul actually was in a Nazarite vow because normally it was a 30-day vow according to what we've discovered in Jewish writings of that time. A minimum of 30 days. He wasn't even in Jerusalem for 30 days. It wasn't going to be a 30-day thing. It was going to be a, a one-week thing we see in the text. So it appears that Paul was going to pay for those. At the end of that period, designated period, however long these four individuals decided to be under this vow of 
commitment to the Lord of denying self and just wanting to separate themselves unto the Lord. At the end of that, uh, we see in Numbers that they would offer a sacrifice to kind of bring it to a conclusion. And that it seems like these guys were coming to the end of their vow. Uh, Paul was going to pay for their sacrifice and the related expenses to that as he too was at least um, committing himself to the Lord for this period. Some commentators believe that Paul may have been coming back and offering a sacrifice because he'd been um, dealing with Gentiles. And according to Jewish teaching and customs at that time, if you interact with a Gentile, you'd have to, you were considered ceremonially unclean, ritually unclean, and you'd have to come and offer a sacrifice. So it wasn't necessarily a sin that they committed, but you cannot go into the temple because you've dealt with something that's unclean, a dead body, in this case, Gentiles. They eat pork, other things. You're now unclean. Go offer a sacrifice so that you can be ceremonially clean. And and I don't know if I, I necessarily buy into that, but he's going to show commitment to the Lord. So we pick up then verse 25. But as for the Gentiles who have believed... We have sent a letter with with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what has been strangled, and from, interestingly enough, sexual immorality. Here's our term that uh, Jesus used back in Matthew 5. And we saw as we were looking at Acts 15 what they understood. And we, we get a hint as to what it's meant because in Leviticus 17 and 18, these things are listed out. Um, not eating things sacrificed to idols, not eating thing, any the blood or animals that ha, the blood hasn't been drained, things strangled, so they were not allowed to eat something that died of itself. And we get a hint to this because when James first listed it, if I'm pretty sure it was James who listed it, they're out of order. And then in the same book, in the same chapter there, later on in the conversation in Acts 15, they're set in order, a different order. And as we go back to Leviticus 17 and 18, that's the order. So they were thinking of something. So we can, we can understand, get an idea of what they understood sexual immorality to be. They're basing it on this understanding back from Le Leviticus 17 and 18. Fair enough? Do you track with that? Sorry if it's fuzzy and I didn't explain it well. So what's going on, he's saying. So we're just dealing with the... With the Jewish perception. We've already dealt, dealt with the Gentile perception. You're, our truth isn't changing here. We're just trying to show the Jews that you haven't, as we entitled it last week, we thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We haven't abandoned the Mosaic Law altogether. We're teaching that which complements and gives a fuller understanding of it. We haven't abandoned it. There's a world of difference here. Verse 26. Then Paul took the men... And the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. So how'd it go? Verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple. Remember, Paul is just getting back from parts of Asia. When we think of Asia, we're thinking China, Japan, that way. They're referring, they're use of the term Asia is a little bit different than ours. They're talking more Turkey. So they're talking uh, modern-day Greece, Turkey, more north and actually west, than we're, whereas we're thinking north and east of Jerusalem. So these Jews are probably coming from some of the places that Paul had visited. They probably recognized them. So when the seven days were almost completed, again, verse 27, the Jews from Asia... Seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people. Who's the people? The Jews. Teaching everybody, everyone everywhere against the Jews and the law in this place. What place? Jerusalem. So if, if you're throwing out Moses and the law, you're obviously against the Jews. You're against Jerusalem. So that's the accusation. And look at how broad they're saying. He's teaching everyone, everywhere. Those are pretty broad terms. 
Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this place. Notice verse 29. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with them in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Remember, uh, a Gentile was not allowed in. To, to They could only think of concentric circles. Your outer circle, an inner circle, still an inner circle, yet one more circle. So Gentiles were allowed to the... To the to the, what's the word I'm, I'm wanting? The area of the Gentiles. There's a word. Sorry, I'm, it's, it's just kidding. It's right there, kind of like a foyer. Um, anyway, the, the women, Jewish women, could go a little bit further than the Gentiles, but not as far as the Jewish men. The Jewish men could get yet a step further, but they're still outside of the temple proper. The Levites were allowed a step further within the temple, but only a certain amount. Only the priests. So the Levites and priests, it's kind of a little tricky. When we talk about priests, the Levites were priests because they helped the priests. But technically, they were not of the sons of Aaron. Aaron was of the tribe of Levi, but so was Moses. But Moses really wasn't. The, God designated Aaron and his sons to be the, the priest and Aaron the high priest. So only Aaron and his sons could actually do the offering of the sacrifices. So the people would bring the sacrifice, and only the priests, Aaron and his sons, could actually kill the animal and go and sprinkle the blood on the altar. And then one step further, only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. So you have all of these stages and steps to which people were allowed to enter. And so they believed that Paul brought this Ephesian guy further than what was allowed of the Gentiles. So again, verse 29, uh, For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at, uh, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that, uh, that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was, what he had done. Someone in the crowd, some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. Isn't that usually the case in a mob? They don't even know what's going on. Such conflicting information, all that. And it's, it's sheer emotion not based on fact necessarily. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. So the centurion was actually afraid that Paul's going to be ripped in half. He's afraid that the, the mob's actually going to kill him. Verse 37, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? <laughs> and he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian, then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the Assyri uh, assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, per permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, and then we're going to start into chapter 22. So this is kind of quite comical. Uh, there's a big mess now. So the advice was, go to the temple, offer sacrifices, and hopefully everybody will see that you've not thrown out the whole Mosaic law. He goes and does that. The seven days aren't even up. Somebody sees him, and they've seen Trof Trophimus uh, with him before, and so they suppose that Paul has brought him, this Gentile, in there, and it all goes south. The guards come down because of all the commotion. The crowd's saying two different things or a number of different things. The guards arrest him, and they actually think he, he's an Egyptian. That's kind of funny. Most Egyptians would probably have a little bit darker skin. Um, hasn't even talked to Paul yet. He's surprised that Paul knows Greek. 
interestingly enough. And now Paul has hushed the crowd and he's speaking yet another language, Hebrew. So Paul's obviously a well-educated man. Let's continue on. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense now that I the the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city. So he was brought up in Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a known scholar, a very respected uh, scholar there in, in Jerusalem, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. That, that's why Paul's in trouble, because they're all zealous for the law. And he says in verse 4, I persecuted this way. This, this what? This way. What is he referring to? Jesus called himself the way, the truth, and the life. And so the teaching of Jesus came to be known as the way. You are people of the way. You are, you are people of Jesus and his teaching. And so Paul is saying, I persecuted this way, Jesus and his teaching, to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of el elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now we pause here for a second. The Jews listening would have had an element of respect for somebody who was zealous in the law, who had authority by the scribes and the elders that John, that uh, Paul had here. So he's he's kind of, it's not that he's manipulating or playing the crowd. He's showing his credentials. I was just like you. I was doing things legally. I was equally as zealous. I had an in with the leaders that most people would long for. I was doing it. The Jews would have respected anyone who had a vision. Oh, you have a track with God. Not just the elders and leaders, but... Wow, God's talking to you? Not every Jew experienced that. So this is going to cause them to listen further. And so here's the vision. He heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I also answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. So I love it that Paul is not backing down or being politically correct. The Jews, many, most of the Jews would have known exactly who Jesus is. He's a controversial figure. And Paul would have known that by speaking this part would have been very controversial. He's not helping his cause, but he's committed to the truth. Verse 9, Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. So back earlier in Acts, I believe it's chapter 9, says that the other men heard. Here we have a little bit more clarification. They heard a noise, but they didn't discern the words that were spoken. Verse 10 here and I said, What shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, Rise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand uh, by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, so this is interesting, Again, the Jews would take note that a respected Jew is actually welcoming this fellow. Calling him brother. Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one. Who's that? Jesus. And to hear a voice from his mouth. Jesus' mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Again here, arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The washing away of your sins is in relation to calling upon the name of the Lord, not of being baptized. They saw the two so exclusively mutual, they lumped them together. You're only saved by asking Jesus to be your Savior. The natural step is then, once you're saved, to tell the world, I belong to Christ. How? By believer's baptism. But they lumped them together. You're not saved by being baptized elsewhere. They don't even include that. What must I do to be saved? Repent. 
So it's repentance, not baptism. Sometimes they say repent and be baptized, but it's not repent and be baptized for salvation. You, we've, I think we're all on the same page. Verse 17. When I ret- returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, our, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed them. And he said unto me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So God knew that it was going to be problematic, hard for the Jews to, to trust Paul, and he sent him away, and he's going on his missionary journeys. Verse 22. Up to this word, they listened to him. That's kind of interesting. For you and I, we would have checked out a little bit further when you start talking about visions and other such things. You'd be like, okay, this is a crazy guy. Back in that day, there, God was still using visions to communicate. And so they didn't shut him off right then, whereas you and I would, because God only speaks through his word now, not through visions, dreams, tongues, or other such things. They listened until they heard the word what? Gentile. Go, for I will send you far away. I'm in verse 21, the command of Jesus. Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And at that, they were done listening. At that, their minds were made up. So verse 22. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, that was a Jewish way of distress and, and vehement feeling and emotion towards a situation, to throw dust in the air. The tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. So obviously, where there's smoke, there's fire, <laughs> Right? And so the, the guard is saying, yeah, you've got to have done something wrong. Let's, you're, you're not being totally truthful. We'll examine you by flogging. The, Jew, the, the Romans were allowed to do this to non-Roman citizens, to try them by flogging, to get them to pain makes people talk. That's what they were going to do. Verse 25. And when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a long, for a large sum. So he wasn't even a Roman by birth. He had to work hard and purchase his citizenship as a soldier. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribute also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. He wasn't even allowed to bind him without a trial. He was about to beat him. Thankfully, he stopped there, but he's already broken the law himself as a tribune. So, wow, there's a lot going on here, right? Let's take a moment and pray and ask God to bless us as we continue our study. Father, in these moments, we still have so much to work through, and our time is so limited again. I pray that you would help me make the best use of our time together as we study your word. Would you lead me, Father, and direct my thoughts? Uh, Help me to articulate quickly, without repetition, undue repetition, what you want to be stated and us to think about and meditate upon and ponder. And more than just think about for us to change within our own hearts and lives to be more like Jesus. Thank you for using a servant like Paul, who is a sinner just like us, who is imperfect, but one who is committed. And so, Lord, would you help us grow in our love and commitment to you? Uh, Lord, we thank you for including not just the fun, sweet times in Scripture, but even the difficult ones to prepare our hearts and minds for thinking in the event, our hearts and minds and our thinking for the event that that you may have us suffer for your name's sake. And so, Father, protect us from me, from human logic, 
from me being the weak link. I pray that you would truly take over and allow us to feast upon your word, the fellowship with you and your spirit. Draw us to yourself. May this be a very precious time, a very practical time in our, our walk with you. Help us to take one more step closer to you, we pray. Bless the ministry downstairs with the children. Give wisdom to those that are leading and teaching them. We do pray, Lord, that you would give tender, teachable hearts, both here, upstairs, uh, in this place, but around the world as people are being exposed to your word yet again. Lord, we cheerfully place ourselves under your authority. We give ourselves to you. Do your will in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we talked about primarily how following Jesus does not mean the abandonment of the Old Testament. Paul was not throwing out the whole Old Testament. And so we talked about how the Mosaic Law functioned. It was more than merely a covenant document for the Jews. So the law was given as a as a covenant document, but it was more than that. So back in the day, there's, it was called a Susa Reign Covenant. Susa Reign is between a greater and a lesser. So where two countries fight, two armies, they fight, and the one who wins is the superior, they're the greater, and they extend terms of peace to the, to the conquered, to the lesser. We'll stop fighting, and we won't kill you if you pay taxes, you quit fighting us, you give us all of your chariots or horses, uh, you pay us a yearly fee of so much gold, so much silver, we get so, such a percentage of your wheat and your grains and your oil and your wine and all these things. And if you agree to these terms, we'll be at peace. And if not, we'll continue to fight. We obviously are going to win. And so it's an agreement between the greater to the lesser. And it was conditional. So what's going on here with the Mosaic Law, it's, it's that type of covenant offered and extended by God, the infinitely greater, to his people Israel specifically, not the whole world at this point, just to the Jews, infinitely lesser than God. And it was conditional. Obey me and I will bless you. Disobey me and I will work against you. In fact, he says, I will curse you. So Moses says, this day I present before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey, a curse if you don't obey. And God laid out all the warnings beforehand. If you disobey me, I am going to take away the rains. I'm going to cause not only your animals and other such things to not produce, your fields will not produce, your wives will be barren. You'll have disease and all kinds of difficulties and struggles. I'm going to bring in nations around you to come fight against you. I will fight against you through them. Not because I hate you, not because I'm throwing a divine temper tantrum, but because I want you back. I'm willing to do what it takes to get your attention, to put you in a spot of struggle and misery until you're on, you're on your back and you're only looking up and say, Okay, God, I surrender. I wave the flag. You win. I repent. I won't follow their gods. I won't do my own thing. You are my God. And when you do that, I will bless you again. I'll remove all of these bad things and you'll be under my umbrella of protection and blessing yet again. God's desire is always repentance. So the Mosaic Law then was more than a, merely a covenant document between the, the infinitely superior God and, and the Jews. It was a document, and, and not just ten laws, the Ten Commandments, but it was, there's 600 and, depending on how you count it, 13 or 618 commands that provided a worldview. So the Mosaic Law established a God-oriented worldview to the Jews. And God wanted to use the Jews to be the ones who share that worldview with the other surrounding nations, with the world. And this is a God-oriented worldview. So God commanded that, we talked about this, and I don't want to spend a long time here, God dictated what they could and could not eat. It's not that the pigs are, are unbiblical. When God created the pigs... In all things, he said, it's good. In fact, at the end of creation, it's very good. So it's not that God made something bad, oh, don't eat that, I, I botched that. No, 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 no. I want you to realize that all that you eat or don't eat is to be done in light of me. I'm telling you because I am the one who defines what is true. I am the one who defines what is righteous. 
I am the one who defines what is, is beautiful. I'm saying for you, during this period of time, you may not eat certain things. Eat when they could work. Six days, not on the day of rest, not on the Sabbath. All the other nations, they could work seven days a week. No, I don't want you to do that because I want you to stop and worship me on that day and realize that you are dependent upon me for the rest of the six days as well. I am your income. I am going to bless you if you walk with me. Who they could marry. What they could wear. So they were not allowed to have garments of mixed clothing. You cannot have wool and linen. Either all wool or all linen. Why? Did God make the worms to make the silk and such thing? Yeah. Were they bad? No. Did God make the, the sheep with the wool? Yeah. Was that bad? Both are good. Why can't you? Well, the other nations do that. And I just want you to be distinct. That's all. I want you to have this worldview that I have the last say on everything you do. Even what you wear. Even what you eat. And it goes on from there. They had to wear tassels in their clothes. Just all kinds of different things to help them remember their position before God. A worldview. There was a, a bunch of other things we talked about and many that we didn't. But the law then is is that which God gifted to them to provide a worldview that centers on Him. We exist because of God and for God. And we do not have the right to do whatever we want, even in our own personal decisions, at home or otherwise. And that's something we Christians need today. So Paul did not throw out the whole Old Testament. There's principles here that are yet guiding us today. It established a divine standard of morality. So God says, even though the other nations do certain things, you are not allowed to do those things. And we've detailed some of them. Uh, God is the one who defined what is true, righteous, and beautiful, not us. So we must conform to him. He sets a standard of morality. And so that's why we read from Matthew 5 this morning. It's way more than just keeping the moral mosaic code. So in six instances or illustrations, Jesus said, you've heard it said this, and he's quoting a portion of the law or an application of the law as it relates to divorce. And he says, no, no, you've heard it said this, but it's wham, way up here. There's a higher standard. And the reality is, you can't do it. You can't even get the low stand right. Because what's going on is that there's a heart issue that God is addressing. We are all rebels at heart. We all want what we want, when we want it, how we want it, and we don't want anyone to put any parameters on us. We want to govern our own lives. And God says, no, that's not how it works. And it's not a matter of you keeping the law. In fact, you can't because from God's standard, here's righteousness. Not just what you do, but what you think. How you feel towards other people. Hatred. Despising uh, a soldier or your enemies or other such things. God's concerned about the heart. And the whole point of the law is that you have a, a guilty, sinful heart that cannot be fixed by keeping the law. You need Jesus. So it demonstrated an inability to attain righteousness, and therefore it pointed to Jesus. Uh, I didn't take, I, I pointed out a couple, let me just read a few more verses, I think, that are just fun and exciting. So primarily, when we talk about the law pointing to Jesus, and we see people making comments that, uh, the, the weighted one is here. Are you the? So they're asking John the Baptist, "Are you the one we've been waiting for?" Uh, what are they referring to? Who's this one? In Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, Moses is writing. It says, "The Lord our God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen." So they're thinking, okay, so Joshua's the next guy. Well, yeah, he's the next leader, but he ain't it. Okay, Joshua's passed off the scene. You have a series of judges, Samuel, uh, the last prophet for a while, or uh, 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 last judge for a while. 
You have Saul. Okay, he was a bad king. David, man after God's own heart. Solomon, the wisest man in the world. Okay, he does not it. They're waiting for this coming, the big one. So the Elijah comes. Ah, nope, not Elijah. He died. He's gone. He didn't die. He was taken away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Slip of the tongue. He was taken away in a whirlwind, but he was removed from the scene. Uh, Elisha, is he? Th they're waiting for the ultimate deliverer. So, f 600 years have passed, give or take. There's been a 400 year window of silence between the testaments. Jesus comes, and now they're saying, Ah, the one we've been waiting for is here. Here is that. Here's our, here's our guy. He's working miracles just like Moses. He's able to do things that Elijah did a lot. So the, there's pockets of miracles in Scripture. Moses, Joshua, Moses and Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, and then Jesus. Were there a few along the way? Eh, sure. But nothing like these pockets where there was just a truckload of miracles during these times. And many of the miracles that Jesus did were meant to be done to draw the connection of what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, there's another one coming, listen to him. So like Moses, God provided manna in the wilderness where there was no food to be had. God provided manna in the wilderness and water out of a rock. Jesus is able to feed the 5,000. A few fish, a couple fish, a few loaves, and he does this miracle. He feeds another 4,000. He turns water into wine at a funeral, at a wedding. Sorry, that wasn't purposeful. At a wedding. Sorry, ladies. I'm in the doghouse. Uh, these miracles were meant for the Jews to draw the connection. He's it. This is the, this is the one. At the end of his life, actually, Jesus is persecuted and, and murdered, died on the cross, raises again, in Luke 24, he says this, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus ties it all together for the disciples. They didn't get it even after he died. They didn't even get it after he rose again. Well, they started to get it, scripture tells us. Once they saw the empty grave, things started to, they remembered things, and things started to fall into place. But yet, there were still missing pieces, pieces upside down. They still don't see the big picture that they're trying to, that God wants them to get. And so Jesus comes along and he specifically says, beginning with Moses, so when you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are you thinking Jesus? You're thinking, you pass this part to the interesting parts, all right? This whole Le Leviticus, that's a tough book to get through. Numbers, all numbers, all these numbers, lists of people and all these things. Speckled in there, there's a few little interesting things. Ah, Jesus said, John chapter 3, As the serpent was lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Isn't that in Numbers? There's things in there, tucked in here and there and everywhere. Paul connects a dot for us in, John, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So he says, in fact, uh, did I write this one down so I don't have to look it up? I have to look it up. Um, in 1 Corinthians, actually a couple in 1 Corinthians for us. I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians 5 because it's referring to Christ for us. Paul makes this connection that some may not have, have made. He says, verse 6, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So back in Exodus 10, 11, 12, we're dealing with the Passover, God's deliverance of the Jews out of Egypt, from under bondage and slavery, out, they're supposed to go to the promised land, but they botch it because they start complaining. They believe the ten bad spies instead of the two good ones. They refuse to go fight. And God says, fine, your generation is going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. You're going to die. Your children are going to go in and possess the land. But Paul here is connecting the dots. The Passover of Exodus is pointing to Jesus. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the Jews were not allowed to eat bread with yeast in it. Leaven. And here the connection is for us, that's a spiritual picture of sin. The Jews were supposed to cast out, put out all leaven from the house for a week. No leaven in anything, no yeast in any of your bread or anything. Eat unleavened bread, crackers, no yeast. Why? Well, the picture is that here for us, Paul says, this leaven is equated with sin. Purge away the sin, and there's in preparation for this Passover feast, actually in conjunction with the Passover feast, this Lamb of God. And so Paul ties that together for us. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says this, um, verse 11, Now these things happen to them as an example. Actually, I think I need to begin in verse 4, I'm sorry. Let me, yeah. Jonathan, I'm going to back up a little further. Verse 1, they mocked me earlier today because um, in, in starting in one point, I always say, well, to get the context, we have to back up. And I do have to back up here. Verse 1, for I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. So he's referring to when they were led out of Egypt, what appeared? The cloud of God's presence. A cloud by day, fire by night, so that they could keep traveling. They had light to travel by even at night in order to escape the Egyptians. Our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. That's kind of weird terminology. In other words, all were participants with Moses in this. It's not that Moses was the Savior. Moses was a picture of the Savior. Moses was the deliverer. Jesus is going to be our ultimate deliverer. And we are eventually going to be baptized into, in Jesus' name to symbolize him. But So baptism is, is, a, is a tool that shows identity and participation with. Right? So when we are baptized, it says that we died with Christ. Now, we're still alive, but our old man died with Christ. There's identity and participation in. When Jesus died, my old man is put to death as well. When I ask Jesus to be my Savior, I die with Christ. My old man is put to death. I rise to walk in newness of life. So baptism here, identity, participation. Our fathers participated with, with Moses in the cloud and in the sea, verse 3, and all ate the same spiritual food. What's that? Manna. It's not that the manna was spiritual. It's that it has a, a divine origin. That's what makes it spiritual. So it's merely a wafer that would come down, kind of like this bread stuff. It's called manna because the word manna means, what is it? The Jews saw it. What is that? Never seen this before. That's what, how it got its name. Manna. What's that? And it's spiritual food, not that it's, ooh, makes me super spiritual. I don't get spiritual life from it, but it has a divine origin. They were experiencing God, God's divine provision, even in the wilderness. And they all drank the same spiritual drink. So they had water. It wasn't spiritual or holy water. It didn't make them holy. It quenched their thirst. But what made it spiritual is that God provided it for them, right? For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. All right, this is a head scratcher. The rock was Christ. Now, is it literally Christ? No. According to Jewish tradition, uh, obviously they're in the wilderness. It's recorded that God, early on, as they first came out of Egypt, they lacked water, they complained, and God provided. Moses had to speak to the rock. He spoke, and water came forth. Towards the end, again, they were thirsty, and God commanded Moses this time not to... I'm sorry, the first time he, he was supposed to hit the rock. The second time, he was supposed to speak to it, but he didn't speak to it. He hit it. Remember this? Because of that, he couldn't go into the promised land. So he hit the rock again, and God provided more water. I believe that's a... Remember the fancy word merism? A merism is uh, polar opposites and everything in between. So I am the first and the last. It doesn't mean I'm just the beginning and the end. I'm everything in between. Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first letter, the last letter of the alphabet and everything in between. Teach your children when you when they get up and when they go to bed, and everything in between. Those teachable moments all day long. That's a merism. Polar extremes, 
the, the both ends and everything in between. And so the Jewish mind was this giving of water by the rock happened in the beginning, happened in the end, and everything in between. And there were some who suggest, Jews back in the day, suggest that the rock followed them. I don't think so. And I don't think that's what that uh, Paul is speaking about. What he's saying is that Jesus was present with them in the Old Testament. As they came out of Egypt, the Father was leading, Jesus is participating in it. I was just reading in Nehemiah recently, and actually it talks about the Spirit involved in this as well. The whole Trinity is involved in their exodus, their deliverance from slavery into freedom. That's going to picture them point forward to Jesus' ultimate deliverance to the ultimate freedom. The real problem isn't the Roman Empire or any government. It's our sin problem, right? And Jesus provides for our sins. So, how did we get off into that little rabbit trail? That was a fun one. All this is pointing to Jesus. And Jesus said, he started with Moses and the prophets. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Again, in, verse, in, in chapter 24 of Luke, verse 44, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So that's the whole Old Testament. The law of Moses, there's your first five. The prophets, the Psalms. It's, that's the Old Testament. The whole Old Testament is pointing forward to Christ. He's the fulfillment of it. And so Paul is not throwing out the whole Old Testament. He's not throwing out the Mosaic Law. He's saying the Mosaic Law is fulfilled in Christ. There's truths here that still apply to us, even though we're not Jews, and even though we're not under the law. We don't offer sacrifices today. So, how's that for a review? Oh. Is it really 1215? I cannot believe this. I'm going week three in my... That was a review. I cannot believe this. All right. So, the Mosaic Law was more than a covenant document for the Jews. It was more than just a basis of Jewish customs. God was showing how Old Testament or New, we have idols of our hearts. It reveals our own re our, our rebellious will towards God and our lack of commitment to Him. And so Jesus comes along and says, you've heard it said this, but let me show you just how uncommitted you are. Let me show you just how rebellious you are. Let me show you how sick and diseased spiritually you are. You need me. And it's about time you get committed. And we'll have to go into that next week. Sorry. Let's pray. Father, I guess we needed to review. I didn't plan on this. I was wanting to jump right in. And this is just such good stuff as we connect the dots. As we take time for us just to see how relevant the Old Testament is. Lord, as we evaluate our own lives and see how uncommitted we are, how full of idols we are. How we love so many other things other than you. And while it's easy for us to point the finger at the Jews and to shake our heads in disgust at how fickle they are, the reality is you want us to see just how fickle we are. How grossly selfish and undisciplined and ungrateful and proud and lustful. Lord, we are rebels at heart. And we need Jesus to save us and to keep us saved. And we need you to transform our hearts, to, to pry from our grips the things that we love and hold dear. Lord, we want you to be our soul's one pursuit. And so, Father, would you would you continue that work in our hearts and lives? Don't let us alone. Please don't let us alone. Do what it takes to 
stimulate and grow our love and commitment to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for your patience with me. You're dismissed.